Powerful and deadly Hurricane Hugo now over the Atlantic, casting an evil eye at the U.S. mainland. In the wake of the hurricane, a storm of violence as looters go on an unchecked rampage in the U.S. Virgin Islands. This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting. Good evening. The southeast coast of the United States is now officially on notice. Hurricane Hugo is on the way. Potentially the deadliest storm of the decade, it could crash land as soon as Thursday night, somewhere between northern Florida and central North Carolina. The National Hurricane Center put the entire area under an official hurricane watch this evening. Now, let's check the map. The hurricane is northeast of the Bahamas, about 600 miles southeast of Savannah, Georgia. Top winds, about 105 miles an hour. This is still a very dangerous hurricane. The storm is moving toward the northwest, and it's picking up speed, now moving at about 17 miles an hour. As the hurricane approaches, here's the area that is now under the official hurricane watch. It stretches from St. Augustine in the northernmost part of Florida up to Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. This is the area the hurricane is considered most likely to hit sometime during the next 36 hours. Just a few minutes ago, I talked with Bob Sheets, director of the National Hurricane Center in Carl Gables, Florida. Dr. Sheets, when do you expect this hurricane to move to the mainland United States? Well, we expect it sometime at the earliest, late Thursday night, more likely early Friday morning. And what are the chances that will decrease in intensity? We don't think it's going to change much over what it is right now. It's uh, around 100, 105 miles per hour, maybe plus or minus 10 miles per hour. Category 2 hurricane. Down from its very top winds of, say, 140, but still a very deadly hurricane? Yes, very much so. And, of course, the conditions along the east coast of the U.S. are much worse than they are in the Caribbean because now we have a storm surge problem. That is the, the dome of water that moves across the coast when that hurricane makes landfall. The core question, of course, is where will a hurricane hit? Forecasters have to guess, but they guess after feeding facts and figures into their computers to come up with some best bet probabilities. The highest likelihood right now is that the hurricane will roar ashore somewhere between Daytona Beach, Florida, and Charleston, South Carolina. That's most likely. Somewhat less likely, but certainly possible, is that the hurricane will hit between Charleston, South Carolina, and the North Carolina border or in central Florida. Considered least probable that the hurricane will take a turn and land in the Miami area or up around Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. Remember, hurricanes swirl in a counterclockwise position. High water will be highest in this particular section if it follows what is predicted for it. And these probabilities are simply for a first hit of the center of the hurricane. After the hurricane lands, it could barrel way up north hitting other areas along the East Coast, or it could bounce back out to sea and then crash ashore somewhere else. In the Caribbean resort islands, where Hugo is history, cleanup and relief operations are underway. In the U.S. Virgin Islands, on the heels of the natural disaster, man-made violence and lawlessness. And the U.S. Coast Guard tonight moved in to rescue tourists and residents. CBS News correspondent Juan Vasquez begins our coverage from St. Croix. It's still a looter's holiday on St. Croix. At the Coca-Cola bottling plant, people were scooping up as much of the real thing as they could carry. With drinking water scarce and no relief system in place, it's every man for himself. There's been substantial looting. Uh, looting is rampant downtown. I think it's probably safe to say that most of the stores at this point are pretty well uh, cleaned out. Uh, so I think they need to try to establish law and order as quickly as possible. That means rushing help into St. Croix quickly because the police are overwhelmed and the National Guard won't try to stop it unless martial law is declared. That is not my responsibility. I am reinforcing the police department. That is a police function. This used to be the principal shopping center on St. Croix. Today, there's nothing left. Looters have picked it clean and moved on. Any unprotected store on the island is fair game. The manager of this convenience store watched helplessly as scavengers picked over what's left. If people vandalized the store, they did what they wanted, it. I tried to help in protecting things. They said, I can't stop you. These people loaded up their van with everything in the store. They claimed it was destined for a refugee shelter, and the only way to get food is to take it. I think that getting the shelter started is why we're doing this. Um, but if not, my name is John Warren, and somebody can send me a bill for it later. But some people saw it as an opportunity, one giant giveaway. How are they giving it free? It's for free. I'll protect what's mine. 
This shopping center is the only one on the island untouched by the crime spree. Here's why. An attempt to rob these stores could lead to bloodshed. We have around 24 men, all of them armed, with rifles and guns to protect ourselves. To add to the fear of island residents, there's a problem of the missing prisoners. During the height of the storm, guards abandoned the island's major prison. Up to 100 inmates may have walked away to join in the looting and are still at large. Juan Vasquez, CBS News, St. Croix. The first shipments of U.S. government disaster relief reached the island of Vieques today, three days after Hurricane Hugo swept across the island, just eight miles off Puerto Rico's coast. The Coast Guard dispatched cargo planes from North Carolina. The Army provided trucks and water tanks, and the Navy brought in water to a place that has been without it since Sunday night. The governor's office in San Juan says 40% of the homes in Vieques were destroyed. The islanders say 60% were lost. In some cases, only the foundations weathered the storm. More than 1,000 islanders are now believed to be homeless. There are a lot of, of homes that have been uh, destroyed on the acres. Uh, the power is down and the water is down. However, they're all, they're rallying together. They understand it's a tough situation and uh, I think they're doing quite well. It's doubtful that most people here have heard the reports of looting and lawlessness on nearby islands. The people of Vieques are no less desperate than the looters on St. Croix, but they have responded to desperation here in a different way. Doug Tunnell, CBS News, Vieques. Putting things back together is going to be tough for Thomas Willock. 81 years old. He hopes to be back in his house by the end of the week. I'm very old, you know. I'm old, but I have to help myself. I have to try and help myself because it's a disaster. Very heavy disaster. Ninety percent of the homes in Montserrat were damaged or destroyed in the storm, forcing many people to live and even sleep in the streets. This roof came from across the street there. And where's the house? The house is, you can see part of it here. You can see part of the flooring and you can see part of the house. As it tries to recover from Hurricane Hugo, Montserrat's greatest asset, its island isolation, has become its greatest problem. Cut off from the rest of the world, there's no easy way to get the materials to restore power, water, and housing lost in the storm. Our port is smashed up. There's no port. We're just picking up what we can find in the street and repairing as best we can. It took 16 hours to destroy most of the farms, businesses, and homes on this island. It will take years to rebuild here. But the people who live on Montserrat say they cannot do it alone. Some help has already arrived. U.S. and British Coast Guard boats brought some construction supplies and workers. And the Montserrat military has cleared most of the roads. The other task facing Hugo's victims is recovering from the terror of the storm. You know, it was death. We just passed through death. Life as they knew it in Montserrat is gone for a time, while old and young here try to pick up the pieces. Christine Negroni, CBS News, Montserrat in the Leeward Islands. Worth noting, Hurricane Hugo has a younger sister, Tropical Storm Iris. Now, here is Hugo, northeast of the Bahamas. Iris is here, 250 miles north of Puerto Rico, and moving to the west-northwest at about 12 miles an hour, generally following in the footsteps of Big Brother, about 650 miles behind. The tropical storm's highest winds have dropped to 55 miles an hour, making it only about half as strong as the hurricane, but Iris could still bring rain, dangerously high water, and damaging wind to areas already devastated by Hugo. Now, still to come on tonight's CBS Evening News, weatherman Neil Frank on where he thinks Hugo will hit, Aaron Hayes on the big button up in the danger zone, and Bruce Morton on a ray of hope for the hopelessness of Alzheimer's disease. every years were dropped from the Politburo. The current KGB chief, Gorbachev Backer, is among those promoted to the Politburo today. Joining me now to talk about what these changes may mean, CBS News consultant and professor at Princeton University, Steve Cohen. Good evening, Steve. Uh, does this directly and powerfully strengthen Gorbachev's hand to make the kind of reforms he's been wanting to make? I think it does two good things for him. He got rid of three people who are the most conservative members of the Politburo, particularly in the area of political reform, opponents of his democratization policies. And secondly, he sent a message, I think also to Washington, but to people in Moscow, that he still has plenty of muscle, because there's been talk lately that he was weak, that he was on the ropes. So this is important for him. Now, uh, at this Central Committee meeting, 
ago, Gorbachev announced plans for next year a National Party Congress. Is this related to his strengthening his hand? Sure it is. This is not his Communist Party. It is absolutely not the Gorbachev Communist Party. There is within the party a Gorbachev wing, but it's a minority. They are candid about this. He has said in recent weeks that the, that the party is unreformed. He wants a new party, so he's called this Congress. But it's not clear he'll get the delegates he wants. For example, even today, though he got rid of three people he didn't like, the people he wanted on the Politburo with full votes he didn't get. Steve Cohen, thanks. My pleasure. Search teams found the wreckage today of a French UTA airline flight bound from the Congo to Paris. No known survivors, seven Americans among those on board the U.S.-built DC-10. Searchers said the wreckage was scattered over such a wide area of the Sahara Desert, the plane may have been bombed out of the sky. And in London, a phone caller took responsibility in the name of the pro-Iranian Islamic Jihad. From London, correspondent Peter Van Sant reports. While friends and relatives in Paris mourn the loss of their loved ones, a team of U.S. investigators is leaving Washington tonight, hoping to learn whether a bomb brought down the French UTA DC-10 yesterday, killing all 171 people on board, including the wife of the U.S. ambassador to Chad. We are unable to verify any of the reports of a possible explosion, although we are aware that the airline is now saying a bomb was most likely the cause. The UTA flight originated in the Congo, making one stop in Chad. One hour into its flight to Paris, the DC-10 disappeared from radar. In London tonight, an anonymous caller said the Muslim terrorist group Islamic Jihad blew up the plane. The caller read a vague statement saying the group was proud of the attack and tied it to the Israeli kidnapping of Sheikh Obeid in July. The French government had angered some Muslim groups in Beirut when it put warships off the Lebanese coast in a show of support for Christians there. I think at the moment we must assume that despite the claims of responsibility that have been made, the field is still open on who is really responsible. If the UTA accident was the work of terrorists, it would mark the second time in nine months that a bomb has brought down a jumbo jet. Last December, a Pan Am jet exploded over Lockerbie, Scotland, killing all 259 people on board. This afternoon, Pan Am was fined $630,000 by the FAA for alleged security violations in London and Frankfurt, Germany, discovered after the Lockerbie accident. We need to try and block the weakest um, you know, points in the uh, aviation security system because these are uh, the areas where the terrorists know they can get through. Areas which include remote Africa, where terrorists may have found a weak security link and murdered 171 people. Peter Van Sant, CBS News, London. I just did something incredible. The cure is known for the dreadful disease called Alzheimer's. And scientists are cautious about a discovery they announced today, but it is possible, just possible, that someday the discovery could lead to better diagnosis or treatment. Bruce Morton reports. It is the cruelest illness. It affects an estimated two and a half million Americans. And before it kills, Alzheimer's takes away memory, there? humanity. Can you say the word chair? Can you Stool. say chair? Stool. Alzheimer's is incurable. Scientists have linked the disease to an abnormal protein called amyloid beta found in the brains of Alzheimer victims. Now, for the first time, a group of Boston doctors has found this protein in other parts of the body, the skin, in and near blood vessels in the colon. This raises the possibility of a bloodstream origin for this protein. There is the possibility that this protein could be manufactured elsewhere in the body and then be transported by the bloodstream to the brain. And that has major implications. If this abnormal protein causes the disease, and doctors haven't proven that yet, and if it comes from outside the brain, research into possible treatments would take a new direction. If it's made elsewhere and goes into the brain, you might be able to find a way to block it before it gets into the brain. And since the abnormal protein has been found on the skin, that might mean there could be a simple test for Alzheimer's, a skin biopsy perhaps, though that is clearly some time off. If this turns out to be useful as a diagnostic, I'm sure we're at least two or three years away. Scientists don't know, for instance, how selective such a test would be. Some normal older people have this protein in their skin, too. This is a, another step in the scientific puzzle. Treatments? No. Tests? Not yet. 
but a ray of light in an area where there is mostly darkness. Bruce Morton, CBS News, Washington. A congressional panel voted today to subpoena Samuel Pierce to testify after Pierce failed to show up voluntarily last week. Pierce headed the Department of Housing and Urban Development during the Reagan-Bush administration. Congress is investigating charges of mismanagement and corruption at HUD during Pierce's tenure. The Subaru Legacy L and the Mazda 626DX. Which one is the bigger value? Well, the Subaru Legacy has a lot of standard features the competition doesn't, like more horsepower, power windows and door locks, four-wheel disc brakes, and an ETR AM FM stereo. So, compared to the Subaru Legacy, it's obvious the 626 just doesn't measure up. See your Subaru dealer for details on the special value lease program. Now Red Lobster tempts you like never before with king crab legs, sweet snow crab, luscious Dungeness. It's our Crab Lovers Festival, starting at an incredible $6.95. Give in to temptation. Eight great crab and seafood platters you love, starting at just $6.95. The Crab Lovers Festival. Devil worshiper or an innocent victim of mistaken identity? A Southern California jury in the so-called Night Stalker case reached its verdict today. David Dow reports. We, the jury in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Richard Ramirez, guilty of murder. It William took Doyle. the jury 22 days to find Richard Ramirez guilty of all 13 murders and 30 related felonies he was charged with. Ramirez declined to be present for the verdict. Thus ended the year-long trial of the Texas drifter accused of being the Night Stalker, the serial killer who once terrorized Southern California. All but one of the brutal murders took place in the summer of 85. The killer was dubbed the Night Stalker because he broke into his victims' homes and attacked them while they slept, shooting, stabbing, beating them to death. In some cases, wives were raped after their husbands had been murdered. Victims were robbed, survivors forced to swear to Satan, and sometimes pentagrams, symbols of devil worship, were left behind, scrawled on walls or bodies. Fear spread throughout Southern California as the death toll reached 13. I'm very upset. It's frightening and I'm scared. Everybody is real edgy. We have uh, diligently tried to lock all the doors and windows. Gun sales doubled. A hunt was launched for the man in the police sketch. And Richard Ramirez was finally captured by an angry mob in an East Los Angeles Hispanic neighborhood. Hail Satan. In court, Ramirez was defiant. A guard said Ramirez posted pictures of a victim in his jail cell, declaring there is blood behind the Night Stalker. Defense attorneys said Ramirez was a victim of mistaken identity, but witnesses and fingerprints tied him to the murders and ultimately sealed his conviction. The jury's deliberations were prolonged when alternates replaced two jurors. One had been sleeping on the job, the other was found murdered. Now the court will decide the fate of Ramirez, whether he's sentenced to death or life in prison. David Dow, CBS News, Los Angeles. The Greek parliament today ordered former Prime Minister Andreas Papandreou to stand trial on charges of ordering illegal telephone wiretapping during his eight years in power. An unprecedented coalition of conservatives and communists voted to lift the 70-year-old socialist immunity from prosecution and send him to trial before a special Greek criminal court. President Bush gave the go-ahead tonight to send one battalion of U.S. military police down to the Virgin Islands to restore order in the wake of the hurricane. Besides that, more than 100 U.S. Marshals and FBI agents will be dispatched tomorrow morning. As for the hurricane itself, CBS News and your local CBS station will be tracking the hurricane in the critical days and hours ahead as it approaches the U.S. East Coast. Right now, the hurricane is northeast of the Bahamas and about 600 miles southeast of Savannah, Georgia. It is moving toward the northwest at about 17 miles an hour. If it continues in that direction at that speed, remember it picked up speed today and could pick up more speed tomorrow, the hurricane will most likely track this way over the next 36 hours, possibly heading for a Carolina crash by late Thursday night or early Friday morning. Underscore that this is just a best guess track projection about the center of the hurricane from the National Hurricane Center in Florida. People who live along the southeast coast 
are listening up and taking no chances, as Aaron Hayes reports. The Navy knows when it's time to go. Cruisers, destroyers, support ships, about 20 of them, sailed out of the Charleston shipyard today, headed for sea, away from Hugo. Not everyone appears as concerned as the military here, perhaps because more than half the people who live along the eastern coast have never been through a major hurricane, and they don't know what to expect. I, I don't want it to be a bad hurricane. I myself am not really ready. The last hurricane through here was David, 10 years ago. A mild hurricane, it did some damage, but nothing compared to what Hugo has already done and might do if it comes ashore here. Since David, there's been a lot of new construction. Much of it rushed through without regard to the threat of a hurricane. And experts who watched the hasty buildup where a Hugo could quickly break it down. We might well see damage at wind speeds uh, as low as 70 or 80 miles an hour. As the wind speeds go up, then you go into perhaps the high-rise buildings um, and complete collapse of some of the wood frame construction. Winds aren't the only worry. Some of the new development is only a few feet above sea level. A storm surge from Hugo could put much of this underwater. That's been enough to convince quite a few people here to start getting ready. Don't take no chances. Houses are being sealed up. Charleston City Hall boarded up. Schools closed for the rest of the week. Store shelves going bare as people accept the possibility of Hugo crashing in. As Hugo continues to head this way, plenty of weary people will start leaving, possibly as early as tonight leaving boarded up homes and high-rises to an uncertain fate all along this coast. Aaron Hayes, CBS News, Charleston, South Carolina. Joining us live now is CBS News consultant Neil Frank, one of the world's foremost experts on hurricanes and now the chief meteorologist for our affiliated station, KHOU in Houston. Dr. Frank, what do we need to know and specifically what do those people in the southeast part of the United States need to be aware of? Okay, Dan, the most important thing today to note is that the storm picked up forward speed, moving 15 to 20 miles an hour. That means that hurricane warnings may be posted tomorrow in portions of the hurricane watch area, and that also means that there's going to be an evacuation notice. People need to get ready tonight to evacuate in the morning if they're too told to do so. Now, this dome of water Dr. Sheets talked about earlier in the yeah. broadcast, what's that about? Well, that's the storm surge, and the wind's blowing the water towards the coast, and it can't run away, so it just builds up, and that's why people need to be ready to evacuate when they're told to get out. And when you see the pictures of the hurricane, the area on the upside, the north side of the hurricane, are in the most danger. That's right. On the right-hand side, looking in the direction that the storm is moving. Dr. Neil Franklin Houston, thank you. We'll be talking to you as time goes along. Yeah. And that's tonight's CBS Evening News. Stay tuned to this station for more on the hurricane watch. For now, Dan Rather, good night. Smith. And I'm Kathleen Sullivan. Tomorrow, the latest as Hurricane Hugo heads toward the mainland. Also, Jane Curtin and Lorraine Newman join us tomorrow on CBS This Morning. This is CBS.